Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, visitors and friends. Let us say the prayer for illumination together. It is printed in the bulletin on page two. Let's pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson for today is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Father Lord, we thank you, Lord, for our time of worship. We pray, Lord, that our worship has been pleasing unto you. And now, Lord, as we look into your word, we ask, Lord, that you open our eyes and our mind. The Holy Spirit may grant us understanding of your word and faith to apply your word in our life. Help us, Lord, to be still in your presence and to just hear you. Remove all distractions from our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, to focus on you so that we may hear what you want to tell us this morning. We ask and pray for all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Eileen, for the meditation this morning, taken from Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. I've entitled this morning's meditation, Get Off the Boat. There was once a Scotsman who was taking a trip to the Holy Land. And when he got to the Sea of Galilee, he wanted to hire a boat to cross over to the other side. But when he asked the boatman how much it cost to hire the boat, he was astonished to hear that the boatman quoted him 50 pounds an hour for 
to hire the boat to cross over. And he told off the boatman. He said, in Scotland, I could have got a boat for 25 pounds. And the boatman calmly replied, that might be true, sir, but you are talking about the Sea of Galilee. It's the sea where the Lord Jesus walked on. So it must be special. That's why it's 50 pounds an hour. And the Scotsman thought for a while and he said, Well, at 50 pounds an hour, I can understand why Jesus chose to walk on water. <laughs> Friends, this morning's passage is a very familiar account that we have all read about and have heard Sunday school stories about. It's about Jesus walking in, on water inviting Peter to join him. Just a little bit of background to this incident. This incident happens immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. The people have all been fed and the disciples have collected the leftovers of the fish and the loaves of bread. And Jesus has dismissed the crowd and Jesus was looking to go away somewhere to rest and to pray. But Jesus did a surprising thing. Instead of asking the disciples to be with him, Jesus told the disciples to get on a boat and cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. By the way, the Sea of Galilee is actually not a sea. The Sea of Galilee is actually the largest freshwater lake in Israel. It is famous for fishing. And the commentary tells us that it is famous for its tilapia fish for those who are uh, fishing enthusiasts. So there, Jesus asked the disciples to get onto a boat and cross over to the other side. And the word used in verse 22 is that immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. The word made the disciples uh, is interpreted in uh, commentary as uh, compel, as uh, driving the disciples, making the disciples, forcing the disciples to get onto the boat. Now, the word compel is interesting because it denotes uh, some unwillingness on the part of the disciples. And it's like the story of this boy scout who was late for a scout's meeting. And when questioned about why he was late, he told the scout's master that he was delayed because he was doing his good deed for the day. And he told the scout master, I spent a good length of time trying to help an old lady to cross the road. And the scout master replied, why would that take so long? And the little boy scout said, she didn't want to cross the road. <laughs> that is the meaning of compelling. The boy scout compelled the old lady to cross the road. Similarly here, the Jesus compelled the disciples to go across to the other side of the lake. And Jesus, in all his wisdom and understanding, knew that when they got into the boat, to try to go to the other side, they will be meeting a storm. And the disciples were very reluctant to get onto the boat. The disciples wanted to be with Jesus because Jesus had just did a great miracle. He had just fed 5,000 people. And of course, all the crowd were very excited and want to be with Jesus. So did all the disciples. They wanted to be close to this hero of the hour, this man who had just done a great miracle. But Jesus asked them to get onto the boat and leave him. A lot of times in our life, Jesus wants us to move on in our spiritual journey. Jesus wants us not to be where we are in our situations of comfort. Jesus wants us to move on so that we can learn to stand on our own two feet, even without his presence. To learn to rely on our faith in him, even without seeing him. And oftentimes, it involves God sending us into a storm of testing. God is more concerned about our spiritual growth rather than our own personal comfort. To the disciples, they want the personal comfort of being close to Jesus, this man of the hour. But Jesus had a greater mission and greater test for the disciples. Jesus was more concerned about their spiritual growth. Last week, Pastor mentioned this verse, Jesus may love us as we are, but he loved us too much to leave us the same way. Jesus saw the disciples' life down the road, and Jesus was molding the disciples step by step. And that was why Jesus compelled the disciples to go. 
And that brings me to the first point on your notes. If you could uh, write with me the note that has been given out to you. It is better to be in God's will in a storm than out of God's will in the calm. God's will is the safest place to be. Whether we are facing storm or lightning or cyclones, it is still the best place to be if it is in accordance with God's will. Now, if we move on, we find in verse 23 to 24, it is mentioned there, verse 23 to 24, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the water because the wind was against it. Now, the Sea of Galilee is only eight miles across. At its widest point, it was only eight miles. On a normal day, it would have been very easy to sail across the lake. But that night, there was a huge storm. The winds were blowing furiously. The disciples were trying to row as much as they could, fighting against the strength of the wind. But they were actually going nowhere. They were physically exhausted, and they found themselves stuck in the middle of the lake. And you see the irony of the situation. Here, the disciples were obeying God. Here, they were obeying Jesus' command to get onto the boat and move to the other side. And yet, right in the middle of that obedience, they were facing a big storm. They were struggling, as it were, to make any headway. And so often, it's the same with our life. We, a lot of times, we found ourselves stuck in one of life's storms. And no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, it seems that we are not making much headway. We all have faced times like that. The storms of life never end. And we often wonder what good it is. What good will I gain from going through this storm of life? You know, the lessons here this morning, my friends, is that when Jesus asked us to go through the storms of life, Jesus didn't do it just for fun. Jesus was preparing the disciples for bigger storms along their journey. We know subsequently what the disciples had to go through. A lot of them were persecuted, and some of them died horrible deaths. And Jesus was in this instance, preparing them for that big, bigger storms in their life. Similarly, in our life, God asks us to go through storms, not for the fun of it, but because Jesus wants to prepare us for the greater storms ahead. Storms of correction. If you remember the story of Jonah, Jonah was asked to preach to the people of Nineveh, but he tried to run away. But Jesus had to cause a storm. God had to cause a storm in Jonah's life so that he ended up being swallowed by a fish, so that he knows where he has gone wrong. It's a storm of correction in Jonah's life. Sometimes God asks us to go through the storms in order to perfect us, to mature us. It's a story of this, like this story of this little boy who was playing with his paper boat along a river. And as he was playing with this paper boat, this paper boat drifted away from him and he kept on running after the paper boat, but he couldn't stop the boat from drifting along the river bank. And then a, young, a, a man came and he took a few pebbles of stone and threw it into the river. And this little boy was wondering, what is this man doing? But he soon realized that ripples caused by the stones thrown into the river caused the paper boat to drift back into the safe arms of that little boy. Similarly, in our life, God put us through storms in order to perfect us, in order to mature us, so that it will drive us back into the safety of his arms. And because of that, when we face storms of life, we need to remember that Jesus is there with us. And that was happened. The commentary tells us that the storm began around 8 o'clock at night, and it went on all night long. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, right up to around 3 a.m. And there were still no signs of the storm letting up. By then, the disciples were truly exhausted. They, they were drenched to the bone. They were wet. They were feeling chilly. And yet, they wonder what has happened to Jesus. Jesus was the one who asked them to go onto the boat. And where was Jesus? And in verse 23, and we have the slide before that. And in verse 23, we read that Jesus was up on the mountainside. 
Now, if you know the geography of the Sea of Galilee, it's surrounded by mountains, sloping onto the lake. And there was Jesus sitting on the mountainside. In the midst of the storm, you could imagine Jesus was sitting by the mountainside. Jesus could see what was happening in the boat full of his disciples. What was Jesus doing? Verse 23 tells us that Jesus was praying. Jesus knew what was happening to the disciples. He was praying for the disciples. And that is a source of comfort to us. To know that in our times of difficulty, in our times of storms, Jesus is watching over us. And Jesus is praying for us. In Isaiah 65, verse 24, it is written, I will answer them before they will call to me. While they are still talking to me about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. That is our God. He knows the circumstances of life. He knows the storms that we are going through. While we are yet praying, He has already begin, begun the process of answering our prayers. And now we move on to verse 25. Verse 25 says, During the fourth wash of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. The fourth wash of the night is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And here you have Jesus finally responding. After praying for the disciples, Jesus began to walk towards the sheep. In the darkness of the night, between 3 to 6 a.m. You know, a lot of times when we face storms in our life, we face darkness. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. We are wondering where Jesus is in the darkest moments of our days. This verse reminds us that even in the darkest days of our life, God will be with us. So that takes us to the second point in your notes. Jesus is ever present in the darkness. In the darkness of our life, Jesus will be there with us. And that is why the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verse 11 to 12, Surely, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the, the night shall be light about me. Yes, the darkness hide not from me, but the light shine as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Even the darkest of hours of our life cannot hide us from the face of God. He is there even when we cannot see Him. There will be a lot of times in our life where we think that we are losing the battle with the storms of our life. But this verse reminds us that as surely as the Lord is in control, He will turn up in the darkest hours of our life. Jesus' help is always on time. For us human beings, because of our limited vision, we often think that our prayers are not answered. We often think that why is God delaying His answers? Why is not God coming to answer our prayers? But remember, God's help is always on time, even in the darkest of our days. And that's what happened here. Between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., Jesus came to the disciples right on time, in the midst of the storm. But let's look at how the disciples responded when Jesus came in the darkness of the hour in verse 26. In verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. You know, if the disciples were Malaysians, they probably would tell Jesus, Ay, yo, why you come so late? We waited for you, we thought they were going to come already. That's what the disciples would have said. But the Bible said they didn't say that. They say it's a ghost. It is interesting to know how we react when we are in times of trouble. Actually, if you think about it, the reaction of the disciples is not exactly very surprising. Because there they were caught in the middle of a storm, right in the dark, darkest part of the morning. And here, no one would have expected somebody to stroll along happily taking a midnight walk on the water of the Lake of Galilee. So, when the disciples saw Jesus walking in the water, their minds started playing games. They would never have imagined somebody like Jesus walking along casually towards them. So they thought it was a ghost. 
which is actually quite a realistic expression to, to, to think that Jesus was a ghost. Now, the problem with seeing a ghost in that part of the morning is that you don't know what to expect. When you are really, whether, you're seeing a really, whether you're seeing a ghost or whether you are simply get going mad, you don't really know. And the most frightening, frightening thing of thinking that you've seen a ghost is that you worry what the ghost may do to you. You worry that the ghost may make a ghost out of you. And that's what the disciples were thinking. It's like this story of these two security guards working in a hospital mortuary. It was dark and eerie in the mortuary. And one security guard tells the others, tell the other person, ask the other person, do you believe in ghosts? And the security guard, second security guard say, no, but I'm actually quite scared of them. <laughs> That's what happened to the disciples. They thought a ghost was coming. And yet it was only Jesus. And that's so often the real thing in our life. You know, a lot of times we pray, just as the disciples have been praying. When they were caught in a storm, they thought they were going to drown. They prayed for Jesus to come. And here, Jesus was coming right along in front of them in answer to their prayers. And they didn't see Jesus as Jesus. They thought Jesus was a ghost. And that's similar to a lot of circumstances of life. A lot of times we pray for answers to our prayers. We ask for Jesus to be, to be present. And when Jesus comes, not in his physical form, in answer to our prayers, we do not see Jesus. How many times have it when you have been sick and feeling unwell and craving for some special food and your friend drops by and gives you that food? How many times have the church been praying for funds for a special project and suddenly the church received a donation from an anonymous donor? How many times have we been praying for a person to drop by and visit us because we are lonely and we needed something to share and the friend just happens to drop by and we say, oh, so lucky, such a coincidence. But it is actually God working in the circumstances of our lives, God answering our prayers but we do not see God. We think it's a ghost. We think it's fate. We think it's our good fortune that our prayers have been answered. This morning, the third point on our, on our list is remember to see God when He comes in the circumstances of our lives. Let's not give credit to good, our fortune. Let's not give credit to anything else, but give credit to God because He knows the circumstances of our lives and he answers us when we pray to him. So we move on to verse 27. <coughs> yes. When they cried out to Jesus thinking that he was a ghost, Jesus said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Another version of the Bible says, Be of good cheer. Be not, be not afraid, it is I. They were still in the midst of the storm, but Jesus told them to cheer up. How is that possible? Here they were, drenched, wet, exhausted, and Jesus telling them, Be of good cheer. Be not afraid. And Jesus is exactly there because he said, It is I. It is I is an emphatic pronoun. Jesus is the great I am. He is the one who is in control, even of the storm. And this morning, the encouragement for us is that when we cry out to God and Jesus comes along, He will tell us the same thing. Be not be, not be afraid. Be of good cheer. It is I. And what was the disciples' response? Of all the twelve disciples, only the man, the great disciple Peter, in verse 28-29, Peter responded, Peter responded to the, work, to the words of the Lord. Peter asked for permission to come to Jesus. We often wonder why Peter, of all the 12 disciples, why would, why would Peter ask for permission to come to Jesus? We really don't know. Maybe Peter wanted to test whether this man in front of him was really Jesus. Maybe Peter wanted to boost his ego to be the only person who could walk on water. We don't really know. But it doesn't really matter. The point of the story is that it was only Peter who dared to take the step of faith. When we are caught in the storms of life, 
As I've said just now, Jesus will always come to us. But more than that, Jesus is not content with coming to us. Jesus also wants us to come to Him. And that is the difference. Jesus also wants us to come to Him. He doesn't want us to sing along with the boat. He called us to step out in faith. And the key of the matter is faith. The act of faith must be accompanied by action. From the disciples' perspective, it would be really crazy. Here they were, here they were in the midst of the big, big storm with winds howling and raging around them. Who would want to step out of the boat and try to walk on the lake? It's a crazy solution. It's a crazy response. But that's what sometimes our faith requires of us. District Bonhoeffer says, faith is only real when there is obedience. Peter stepped out in faith, not knowing what to expect, but he knew he had to step out of the boat in order to meet with Jesus. And faith needs to be that way. We need to exercise our faith in obedience. If we do not exercise our faith, it's just empty faith, as the book of James tells us. It's like this story. It's not a story. It's a real-life real life account of my partner. He, one day, he decided that he, he needs to exercise. So he said he wants to take up golf. So he bought an Iacro Golf Club membership. And he bought a bag of golf clubs. But being him, rather disorganized, he kept the bag of golf clubs in his closet. And he never took it out of his closet. Every day, every time we ask him, when are you going to play your golf? Ah, okay, lah, okay, when I find a time, I'll go. But that bag of golf clubs remained in his closet. Similarly, it's like our faith. If we keep our faith in the closet, in the room, and never take it out to be exercised, it will remain dead fit. Until now, my partner doesn't play golf. He probably doesn't even know how to swing the golf club. Because his golf bags is still in the closet. It's never taken out. So similarly, someone once said, faith is like film. It is best developed in the dark. Faith is like a film. It is best developed in the dark. When we chose to exercise our faith, only then will our faith be real. The problem with the church today is we are filled with a lot of bold people. People who are quite happy staying in the boat. But we need people who are water walkers. People who are willing to step out and walk on water. We need risk takers who are prepared to make obedient step of faith in response to God's call. Like Peter, we must be willing to step out of the boat. There's an animal called African impala. Right, okay. African impala is a medium-sized antelope. This animal can actually jump up to a height of over 10 feet when it's out in the wilds. But if you caught hold of an impala and put him in a zoo, you can actually keep him safely within the zoo enclosures with a fence of only 3 feet. And you wonder why this impala doesn't jump over the fence and escape since he can jump over 10 feet. The reason is because this animal will not jump if they do not know where their feet will fall. Because it's covered by the fence, they won't know if they jump over where their feet will land. And therefore, they are reluctant. They are almost not willing to jump over the fence. Similarly, in our faith, if we are not prepared to jump, and we only want to know where we will land before we jump. We will never escape the enclosures of fear that the evil one has put around us. We must be willing to be risk takers, willing to take where our faith, faith leads us, even though we do not know and do not, we are not able to see. Someone once said that we have nothing to fear except fear itself, because fear is the absence of faith. And that leads me to the next point on our note. The life of faith is inherently a life of risk. We cannot say we are people of faith unless we are prepared to take risks 
and do great things for God. If you look at the Bible, the Bible is full of heroes of the Bible, heroes and heroines of the Bible who were prepared to take risks, not knowing what is to come because they have faith in God. We have story of Abraham who left the safety and comforts of his own land to go to this promised land that God has given to him. We have, peop we have people like David who is there to step forward when all the armies of Israel ran away when they see Goliath. We have Elijah, the story that Pastor preached on a uh, couple of weeks back. When Elijah faced the prophets of Baal, challenging the prophets of Baal about which God is the real God. And we have Esther, who went to confront the king in order to save her people. All these people, they stepped forward in faith. They took the risk. They do not know what will happen to them. But they went ahead because they obeyed God and they believed that God would deliver them. You know, friends, it is not very difficult. It doesn't take a lot of faith to stay in bed and cover ourselves with a blanket. But it takes faith to be prepared to step out of the boat to do the will of God. Every step that we take in life is an act of faith. Not faith in ourselves, not faith in our own abilities, but faith that comes from God. That's why in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, <coughs> says, the righteous will live by faith. So this morning, if we are asked by God to do a certain thing, are we prepared to obey? Or are we counting the cost? Or do we want all the answers before we are prepared to make a decision? If we are afraid to take a step forward, unless we know how things will turn out, then I'm afraid faith will always be a mystery to each one of us. This morning, if God is challenging you to share your faith with a friend and you're not sure whether you want to take that risk, whether your friend will laugh at you or whether your friend will ask you questions that you're not able to answer. This morning, if God is asking you to serve in a particular ministry, for example, in the Sunday school, and you're not sure how the kids will respond to you, whether they will run away when they see you, this morning, if God is asking you to serve in a leadership role and you're not sure whether you're gifted, do pray about it. If God has affirmed it in your mind, be prepared to take that risk. Be prepared to step forward because so often the blessings of God is found out in the water and not in the boat. If we choose to stay in the boat, we will miss out on the blessings that God has in store for us. In making the call to His people, God is not looking for perfection. Because if God is looking for perfection, none of us will qualify. God is just looking for someone who is prepared to step out in faith and do something for Him. Remember, there were 12 men in the boat. Only one chose to step out. And because of that, Peter has a story to tell us through all the generations. So what would our story be? We move on to verse 30. When, Jesus, when Peter stepped out and walked towards Jesus, initially he was okay. He was walking on water. But when he saw the hard winds, Howling around, he heard the winds howling around him and he saw, saw the storm. He started to panic. And because of that, he started to sing. Actually, if you think about it, when Peter stepped out of the boat, it's not as if the wind starts, starts uh, uh, howling and the storm suddenly subsides. The winds and the storm were always there. Except that when Peter stepped out of the boat and chose to focus on Jesus, he didn't notice the storms. But the moment he turned his eyes towards the storm, that's where his faith began to shake and he started to sing. But we read on further that Peter did the right thing. When he saw and realized that he was beginning to sing, he refocused back to Jesus. 
And what did he say? Call out to Jesus. He said, Jesus, save me. Isn't it? Now, when we are facing storms and we are beginning to sink, learn to refocus back to God. And the, the clue of the story is that Peter said a very brief prayer, Lord, save me. Prayers doesn't need to be long in order to be efficient. Martin Luther once said, the fewer the words, the better the prayer. Just imagine if Peter was beginning to sink and he started a long, pious-sounding prayer that went on for a few minutes, he probably would have sung before he even called out to Jesus. Before he finished his prayer, he was already under, under the water. So he said a very brief prayer, Lord, save me. When Christ calls us, obey. When storms distract us, pray. And that's what Peter did. So at the end of the story, when Peter called out to Jesus, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him, and went into the boat together with Peter. Now looking at the whole context of the story, what has happened, we will find two ironical things. Number one, as I said just now, the disciples obeyed Jesus, got onto the boat, but found themselves facing a storm. And then we find Peter also obeying Jesus, stepping on the boat, and then finding himself almost sinking. So there are a lot of times in our life when we choose to obey God, but things doesn't seem to be working out. Instead, we seem to be hitting brick walls. We seem to be facing more problems than when we had stayed comfortably in our boats. Is that what God wants us to do? Does God want us just to go out in faith and yet make us face difficulties? The lessons this morning, friends, is that sometimes we will face difficulties when we step out in obedience. But that brings me to the next point. Somebody once said, if it's a result of obedience to Christ's command that the church or the individual Christian is in a situation of danger or distress, there is no need to fear. The next point on our, on our notes if we are doing God, what God wants us to do and find ourselves in the midst of storms, it will come out okay. Just like little Garfield there, it will come out okay. God doesn't promise us an easy, comfortable journey when we step out of our boats. We will face storms. We will face difficulties. Often we will question God, why God? Why you want me to take this step of faith? And yet, it's so difficult. And yet, we are facing so much opposition. Yet, we are facing so much barriers. Remember, if you are obeying God, it will be okay. And that's what happened to the disciples and what happened to Peter. Peter stepped out in faith, he was beginning to sing. But Jesus came along at the right time and got himself into the boat and the storm subsided. In verse 32 and 33, it tells us that the storm subsided and the disciples worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When Jesus entered the boat, there was peace. As the storm lost its power and faded away, the lesson from these verses is that when the presence of Christ comes into our lives, He will give us peace. The storms of life will be powerless. Does that mean that when Jesus is present in our lives, everything will be rosy? No. Sometimes it may be just the opposite. Sometimes when Jesus comes into our life, the storms may get even heavier. But the point of the story is that Jesus Christ will take us to the eye of the storms. In the eye of the storm, there will be peace, even though the storms may rage all around us. Let me give you a story to illustrate this point. There was once a king who offered a prize to the artist who would paint the best picture of peace. Many artists put in their paintings, and the king looked at all the pictures and finally chose two he really liked. And he had to choose between these two pictures as to which one represents peace. 
One picture was one of a calm lake. The lake was the perfect mirror for peaceful towering mountains around it. Overhead was the blue sky with fluffy white clouds. Seems like the perfect picture of peace and tranquility. The other picture also had mountains. But these mountains were rugged and bare mountains. In the midst of the mountains, there was foaming waterfall. It really didn't look peaceful at all. But when the king looked carefully at the picture, he noticed that behind the waterfall, the one circle in red, not very clear, I think the big one, I think the small one, probably clearer. Beneath, behind the waterfall, there was a tiny crack in the rock. And there, in the little crack in the, wall, in the rock, a mother bird had built her nest. In the midst of the rush of angry waters from the waterfall, the mother bird sat in her nest in perfect peace. Who, which picture do you think won the prize? The king, of course, chose the second picture. Because the king says, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, there is no trouble, there is no hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all these things, all this turmoil, all this trouble, but yet still be able to be calm in the heart. That is the real meaning of peace. For us Christians, true peace is found not in the absence of crisis, but in the presence of Christ. And when we receive this peace, we need to worship Him for who He is. And that's what the disciples did. The disciples said, truly, you are the Son of God. They did not say thank you for saving them from the storm. That's thanksgiving. But they chose to worship Him. Worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords as the one true God who is able to grant them peace in the midst of storms. This morning, in conclusion, we have only one life. We can choose to stay in the comforts of our boat. But that's not what God wants our life of faith to be all about. Our final point in the notes, to walk on the water of faith, we need to get out of the boat. To walk on the waters of faith, we need to get out of the boat. In this account, Peter chose to be that person who got out of the boat. And because of that, through the ages, 2,000 years later, we are still talking about Peter walking on water. We did not talk about Bartholomew or Matthew walking on water. We talked about Peter walking on water. Because Peter was the only one of the disciples who chose to get out of the boat in order to walk on water. It is risky to walk on water. It is possible that we might sink, but we will never know until we step out of the boat. So this morning, my challenge to you, church, is to be prepared to get off the boat and respond in faith and engage on the daring adventure that God has prepared for us. Let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. We ask, Lord, for your forgiveness for so often we choose the security of and comforts of our own boat of life instead of responding to your call in obedience. Lord, this morning, help us, Lord, to have the courage to be risk takers for you. Help us, Lord, to have the faith to act in obedience, to step out of the boat when we are called. Trusting, Lord, that even when we do that, when we do face troubles and storms and we may even sink, but we know that your hand will continue to hold us because you are the one and true God that deserves all worship 
and is a God that is in control of all things. So Lord, grant us understanding of your word this morning, that even as we leave this place, we will meditate upon what we have heard and respond in faith and in obedience accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.